This is chapter four, section one, vector spaces and subspaces. And in this video, we're just going to look at vector spaces. But I just want to caution you that starting with this chapter, things are going to shift a bit to the more abstract, which means it's going to be a little harder to wrap your mind around things. You might have to put in some extra time into studying, into trying to understand the examples. Um, I'll do my best to give you all of the material in the videos, but you may find yourself referring to the textbook more often or finding other videos to supplement. And if you do, um, certainly let me know. I can embellish these videos a bit more, but I try to keep these short enough to give you the main idea um, without you know, making a 45 minute video. So consider yourself warned. It's going to be a bit more difficult moving forward, but I know you can do it. So what is a vector space? It is a non-empty set of vectors and two operators, which, is, which are addition and multiplication, such that the following axioms hold for all vectors u, v, and w that belong to the set of vectors. And again, we're just saying they belong to the set. And for c, d, which are scalars that belong to the set of real numbers. So before we talk about each of these axioms, I want to point out to you that we've actually kind of already done this. So as we go through the axioms, you'll say, okay, I know that one. Yes, we've done this one. Yes, we've done this one. But what we've done up to this point is simply use them for the set of Rn. So Rn is a vector space and all of these axioms hold true, which is why all of these will look familiar to you is because we've been here. We've been typically in R2 or R3, sometimes in R4 or 5, etc. But what we want to do now is look at different spaces. And we need to verify these axioms to see if those other spaces may in fact be vector spaces or not. So let's take a look at the axioms and try to make some sense of them. The first one simply says that if you have two vectors, then the sum of those vectors should also be in the set V. So of course this holds true for R2 and R3. And again, we're going to look at some examples where that might not hold true. It also shows that the associative and commutative properties, so commutative here, associative property here, <laughs> that doesn't look like an A, associative property here, hold true for addition. It also says that the zero vector, so I'm going to put a box around this one and you'll see why in a little bit. It also says that the zero vector needs to be in our vector set or our vector space where zero, the zero vector plus any vector is equal to that vector. So this is essentially um, the identity And this is the inverse, the inverse saying I can add something. And again, each inverse is unique, but I can add some inverse to an existing vector. Both are in the vector space and the sum of those two vectors is zero. So those are all of the addition ones. Now let's take a look at multiplication. We again now have that a scalar times a vector is in the vector space. So I can take the scalar times something. Whoops, I'm going to put a box around that one. And then we have the distributive property that I can distribute a scalar that, and this is similar to the distributive property, again, just on the right side instead of the left side, but it's still distributive property. This one is the associative property. And again, it's associative with the scalars. So it's not associative. Uh, we know that matrix or vector multiplication is not associative or commutative. Um, but of course, if we're dealing with scalars, those are. And then back here, again, we're down to the identity. 
So as you can see, I've put a box around a few of these and I have put the box around them because those are the ones that we will most often find issues with. So those are the ones that you're probably going to want to check first. So let's take a look at a few examples of um, where we might not have a vector space. Let's take a look at an example which may or may not be a vector space. And I purposely started with some examples that we could visualize. As I said, we're going to get more and more abstract, so the examples that we'll be able to visualize will be fewer and further between. But here's a great example we can visualize. I have set V of all of the vectors X, Y such that X is greater than or equal to zero and Y is less than or equal to zero. So I know, because I've been graphing for quite some time, that if X is greater than or equal to zero and Y is less than or equal to zero, that's this space down here. That's the fourth quadrant. So my question is, if I have a vector in the fourth quadrant, will it meet all 10 axioms and in fact be a vector space? So let's take a look at an example. Let's say vector U is three, oops, I almost wrote that as an ordered pair, three, negative one. So one, two, three, negative one, here's vector u. Thinking about those 10 axioms, and there were three that I said were kind of the most important to check or the ones that you would check most often where things wouldn't necessarily work out in your favor. Let's start by looking at um, axiom one, which says the sum of u and v is in v. So I only have u, but let's take v, and obviously u is in v already, um, but let's give myself a vector v to just see. So vector v, let's say, is 1, negative 4. And again, this is also in v. And I can see that because X is greater than or equal to zero and Y is less than or equal to zero. So I wouldn't have to have the picture to show that they are in V. But my question is, is the sum of those also in V? So let's just see. Well, we know the parallelogram rule says, so visually I can just look at this and say, yes, that was a really bad parallelogram, but you get the idea. But I can also, add u plus v, which would give me 3 plus 1 or 4, and negative 1 plus negative 4, which is negative 5, and 4 negative 5 is in fact in v because x is greater than or equal to 0 and y is less than or equal to 0. So this one's okay. What's the next one I said to check? Number 6, um, just kidding, number 4. Four. number four that says that the zero vector is in V. So looking here, this is or equal to zero or equal to zero. So that means the zero vector is in fact in V. And the last one, which is six, which says C u or cv, I don't remember which letter I used. Hey, quit changing colors on me. cv is also in v. And keep in mind that c is just some real number, any real number that I want. And this one, hopefully you can see, is going to be a problem. Because what if c was negative 3? then CV would be negative 3 times 3, negative 1, which gives me negative 9, 3, which is somewhere over here, which is clearly not in my region of X is greater than or equal to 0 and Y is less than or equal to 0. So negative 3v does not belong to v 
and therefore this is not a vector space. So notice I didn't say it doesn't meet axiom six because remember your professor doesn't have all the axiom numbers memorized. I have the concepts down. And that's what you should do too is don't rely on those numbers but rely on logic. So my logic says that I can't take all CV and have it belong to V. This one is not met and therefore it's not a vector space. Here's another practice for us that looks very similar. And if you'll notice, the only thing I changed is I said that both are greater than zero. So you might be thinking, well, duh, Brame, we get it, that this, in fact, will still be the case, that I cannot take some vector that's in the space that I want, where both are greater than zero, I can't take it times anything that I want and still end up in that same region. And that is true. But I wanted to give you this um, example specifically because this one also is that zero is not, the zero vector, which is zero, zero, is not in V because this is greater than zero and greater than zero, so zero is not included. So again, obviously we already knew based on this that it was not going to be a vector space, but the fact that the zero vector is not included also tells us that V is not a vector space. Here's a practice for you to try on your own, so give this one a try. When you're ready, press play to see how you did. So again, this is one that we can visualize, and we are saying that xy is less than or equal to zero, which means xy is negative or equal to zero, and that would mean that either x is positive, y is negative, or x is negative, y is positive. So here's what we're dealing with. So let's check a couple of those axioms that have a tendency to give us a hard time. For instance, is the zero vector in V? Well, because it's or equal to zero, yes, in fact, that is true. I could have V as zero, zero, which is the zero vector. What about CV? Is that in V as well? So quite often, this is one that gives us a hard time. For instance, let's say this is two, negative three. We'll say V is two, negative three. This certainly is in V because two times negative three is negative six and that is less than or equal to zero. And what if I took that times a positive value? Well, that would give me six, negative nine, which is still in that same region. Okay, it's just going to make this guy longer. What if I took it times negative 3? Well, that would give me negative 6, positive 9. Would that still work? Well, if I multiply those two, that is still less than or equal to 0. And in fact, it would just be over here. And so, yes, we are just fine. This still holds true. So check, check, I've got two checks. Now let's go back to that very, very first one that says u plus v must be in v. Well, let's say, I'm gonna get rid of these green guys here. Let's say that's my first one and we're going to make, I'm gonna get rid of this, running out of room here. So let's say that u is negative one, five. So negative one, five up here. And again, what is then u plus v? I would end up with two plus negative one, which is one, and negative three plus five, which is two, and one, two, which again, parallelogram rule, we can see clearly this guy is not in V and therefore no, because this guy is not true. Therefore, this is not a vector space. Let's take a look at polynomials. Polynomials, in fact, is a vector space, which seems a little counterintuitive, but we can see in the way that this is written that it's written very much like a linear combination of scalars and vectors. 
same idea. Um, and remember that the degree of a polynomial is the greatest power with a non-zero coefficient. So in this example, n would be the degree of my polynomial, assuming that a n is not zero. And the degree of a constant is zero. So for instance, if my polynomial, oops, I went ahead and wrote it down here. So if my polynomial was just equals a sub zero, meaning I don't have a t or a t squared or a t to the n, then that is the zero degree. And if all terms have degree zero, then obviously the highest degree would be zero. And that's called the zero polynomial. So let's verify the axioms to ensure that this is in fact a vector space. So I've listed the axioms here so that you don't have to have them memorized. But let's take a look at the first one, that u plus v would in fact be in the vector space. So we know the vector space essentially are terms that look like this. They're going to be a polynomial written in this form. So if I added, say, p and q together, so I've written these in terms of vectors, but if I added p and q together, would it in fact be um, in that space? So if I take p of t plus q of t, what would I get? I would get a0 plus b0, and then I would get a1 plus b1 t because I'm adding like terms, plus, et cetera, et cetera. And that pattern would continue. And would that, in fact, be a polynomial? Yes, I would just be combining those like terms. So this one does, in fact, hold. Now, what I know about real numbers is that addition of real numbers is commutative and also associative. So I'm not going to check those because I know that if these guys were in the opposite order, that would still be okay. And if I were grouping things differently, I'm still combining like terms and that's okay. So those have been checked and verified. Is the zero vector? Well, that means, oops, P of T. What if P of T were zero? Would that fit this? Yes, that would just be that A of zero was zero. Is that in the space? Yes, it is. And if I added this, to any other polynomial, would I end up with a polynomial? Yes, I would. What else can I check? Let's check um, the inverse. So p plus negative p, well, it would certainly make sense if I had a0 and let's say q of t were negative a0, and then this was a1t, then this was negative a1t, and we can see if I added those together, I would in fact get zero. So checked, checked. Let's also check if I multiply by something. Well, same as our example here, and again, I keep erasing, I apologize, so there's only so much room. Let's say I take three pt, well, then it's just 3a0 plus 3a1t1, etc. Would that fit a polynomial? You betcha. And again, these all follow. Once I know this one is true, these are just properties of real numbers that can be checked very easily. So hopefully I've given you enough to go on there that polynomials are in fact a vector space.